In May of 2021, the Captive Primate Safety Act was introduced to the United States Congress. If passed, this groundbreaking legislation will outlaw the private keeping of non-human primates as well as most public interactions with them. These would include dangerous practices like photo ops, handling, petting, feeding, and open contact walkthroughs that are regularly practiced at zoos, safaris, and animal shows. Conservative estimates suggest that in the United States, more than 15,000 primates are kept as pets. 21 states have already taken steps to explicitly ban the private ownership of primates, but the legislation differs immensely between the remaining 29 states. 13 states require a permit or license, six states require disease testing, and seven states partially ban or require permits for only select species. Nine states don't have any permit or licensing requirements whatsoever. This means that owning many primate species, in some cases even chimpanzees or other great apes, is still legal in almost 60% of the entire country. You might be wondering, why is this a problem? This means that over 15,000 primates are currently living in the United States right now with no opportunity for freedom or choice in their everyday lives. In most cases, these primates will rarely have access to sunlight, fresh air, adequate space, a proper diet, any medical care, or another of their own kind. Additionally, while owning primates remains legal, humans are consistently put in danger. Hundreds of incident reports from around the country indicate that irrespective of the species, size, age, background, level of habituation to humans, within or outside of an enclosure, and with or without the humans involved having prior wildlife handling experience, primates will react in an unpredictable and aggressive manner in captivity. Even people with a relatively high level of animal husbandry expertise, including zookeepers and veterinarians, have reported injuries associated with aggressive and uncontrollable outbursts. Importantly, trained primates, including service animals, have also been involved in these attacks. This is because primates are wild animals. No matter how early they become habituated to humans, they will never lose their wild instincts, which are often expressed as aggressive behaviors when they perceive a threat. In the wild, primates perceive humans as threats. It takes several thousands of years of intentional and selective captive breeding to domesticate an animal, which has not been accomplished by humans for any primate species. Therefore, no such thing as a tame primate exists. When these animals attack or escape, first responders, including paramedics, firefighters, and police officers are called upon to handle the fallout. Hi, I'm Tim Harrison, a retired police officer, firefighter, paramedic, and still first responder, and director of outreach for animals. I have found a chimpanzee loose in a house, a white tiger in a basement, a cougar loose downtown after chewing through a door and escaping, and people being bitten by venomous snakes in our area and dying from it. There are no schools, no police academies, fire schools, or animal controls teaching you how to handle primates. When every cop, every department has these stories, and the majority of officers have PTSD after dealing with these incidents. People don't realize when there's a chimp attack or a big cat attack or, or a venomous snake bite, it's not like a car accident. No matter what you do, it's not going to always save the victim's life. When an animal escapes, about 90% of the, of the time they are shot and killed. And they don't want to shoot these animals either, they're beautiful creatures. People always come to me and ask, what else can we do? What can we do about this? Uh, we could have our governor fill out paperwork to keep these animals out of people's homes and have legislation beforehand. It's that simple. Every cop says, we want legislation. It's just basic. Get some legislation, common sense legislation, protect the first responders, protect the public, and protect the animals. It's not their fault they're here, but it's our fault we don't do something about it. He's down. 32-42, shots fired. We need the ambulance in immediately. About at 23 months, he started getting aggressive towards me, and it got to the point that I was nervous to even go in his room to clean out his cage. As far as actual interaction, there wasn't much, because I was just afraid to be around him. 
he bit me three times in a month and that had not been a thing prior to that. Um, so I reached out to a handful of different primate sanctuaries around the country. And I remember right after Tim and you me back, uh, telling you that he would be, he would be, have a space at Born Free and that we could move him down there. I remember going into Kai's room and just being so relieved, but so sad. And I went and I sat down in his room and I let him out of his cage and he came and he cuddled up in my lap and I just started bawling because I had, you know, finally made plans to find a new home for him. He was being sweet and I had questioned whether or not I was making the right decision and he attacked my face. I don't know what I would have done if Born Free hadn't taken him in. Keeping him wasn't an option, so I don't know. I guess I would have ended up having to put him down. As much of an impact as he had on my life, and more for the worse than for the better, it breaks my heart to know that I impacted his life just as much, if not more. So I know that he'll never have a real, a real chance of you know, the life he was supposed to live. And I think he's in the best place possible now, given his circumstances, but it could have all been connected. There's a reason more people don't have pet monkeys. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. And if you could be terrified of them when they're three pounds, imagine what they're like at 30 pounds. The work of sanctuaries like ours is necessary because we are not yet at the point where we've managed to prohibit the kinds of practices that are creating the victims that we care for. So right now, the primate pet trade is legal across most of the US. The use of animals in laboratories is legal across the entire country. Um, and the keeping of monkeys in captivity in other situations, including in zoos and other sort of entertainment uh, situations is legal across most of the country. While those practices persist, there will always be victims of those trade who come out to it. And honestly, only a very few lucky ones end up at sanctuaries. Our work is really to do our absolute best for those who we can take on and provide them with the best possible life they can have. Ultimately, though, sanctuary is not the solution to the issue of the pet trade. It's not the solution to the issue of labs. The only solution really is to prohibit these practices once and for all so that we're not creating endless years and years and years of more victims. Freeman is a 20-year-old long-tailed macaque. For 10 years, Freeman lived in a cage that was three foot by three foot by two foot. He was never allowed out of his cage and the cage was never cleaned. He never saw the sun, nor did he ever have any access to fresh air. He was fed dog food and table scraps, as well as being given alcohol and marijuana. Freeman was brought to the sanctuary in 2012 after his former owner was convinced to relinquish him. He is an example of a success story and a rare one at that. He has survived at the sanctuary despite his traumatic past. He now lives in a big enclosure with two other long-tailed macaques named Sissy and Felix. He spends a lot of his time sitting and grooming or being groomed by his friends. He continues to struggle with health issues as do most expats. I absolutely can understand why people would look at a monkey and want to have it as a pet. They're, they're so much like us and there's so much going on in their, in their eyes and in their heads. You look at them and you think like, I could have a special bond with this animal. Um, it, could be, it could be more like a child than a pet. And I totally get that. The problem is that they are their own individual creatures and they're not really, they're not for us, you know, they, they live their own lives and taking them out of the wild to live in an unnatural situation in somebody's home and to be treated like a baby is not, it's not what they're meant for. And it's, it's really, it's not good for them mentally. It's not good for them physically. Um, it's, they, they, they need to live with their own family rather than with humans. Um, I mean, I, I love working with primates. It's one of the most rewarding things, I think, in the world. But when I do it, I think of them more as, 
they're not they're not my pets. They're actually more like my coworkers. Like I'm working with them in order to accomplish some goal. Um, but it, I would never, I would never bring them into my home. They, uh, they're just. I think anyone who's spent actual time with primates would realize that they are not suited to be in anybody's house, um, and it's it's really it's really sad because you think that. Like this cute little small thing can can live with you, and it can be it can be your best friend, and it, and you can love it. But then it becomes an adolescent, and it it tries to hurt you, and it and it tries to rip you apart. And it's just it's just because that's what they do naturally, and and people don't really realize that that's natural behavior. Monkeys fight all the time, and they're much stronger than us. So when they turn that on us, it can be incredibly dangerous. One of the biggest challenges for us, I think, at Sanctuary is that people see an animal's arrival as, at Sanctuary as kind of the fairy tale happy ending. You know, the work is done, they're saved, everything's okay now. And to some extent that is true. They are no longer being tortured, they're no longer being actively harmed. But the challenges that we see are that it's just the beginning of their journey of recovery. These animals come to us and I, I don't use this word lightly, they come to us genuinely traumatized. Um, they come to us, they come to us showing these stereotypic behaviors, sometimes really serious self-harming to the point of, you know, chewing their own hands and feet. We have a monkey who, who literally chewed off part of her feet and part of her tail. Um, so our work really is to see them through this journey. And for some of them, it can be really quick. They can settle in really quickly and they can genuinely just begin to thrive more or less as soon as they arrive. For others, it can take months or years. And for some of them, they just, they never really settle into the life at the sanctuary um, because they've been so deeply harmed by the life previous. And I think that's why it's so important for us to stress that sanctuary isn't the solution um, to these problems that we're seeing, it isn't an immediate happy ending. And for some of them, it isn't a happy ending at all. Some of them can never move past their past trauma. So by addressing the cause of the original trauma is the only way that we're ever going to stop the suffering of these victims. I think one of the things that people don't think about when they consider sanctuaries is the sheer cost that is passed on to these organizations who are predominantly, if not always, not-for-profit. So the cost of caring for an individual monkey for one year, we estimate at our standards to be around $1,250. Now, if we then have to add into that building an enclosure for a new arrival, which we often do because the work of sanctuaries by default means that sanctuaries are running at capacity because we offer a home for life. We don't move them on after they arrive to us. So if we do have to build an enclosure, a complex enclosure for a group of monkeys would be beginning at around $100,000. That means that even accepting a new monkey creates a huge financial burden on us and that prevents sanctuaries a lot of the time for rescuing the monkeys that they really do want to care for but they're simply unable to. And of course private owners cannot provide that kind of funding to look after monkeys who they've either grown bored of or they're scared of because they've become aggressive and they want to rehome. Although we provide the best possible life for the monkeys here at Born Free, we can never release them into the wild. They are much too damaged to behave normally and lack all of the skills they would need to survive. Not to mention that the financial and logistical preparation for transporting just one primate overseas to their native habitat would be much too costly. Even when monkeys fall victim to the pet trade in their home range territories, like in South America, Africa, or Asia, the monkeys that can be released back into their natural environment often struggle with many of the same issues as those rescued from the pet trade in the United States. Though sanctuaries are not the solution to the problem, dedicated staff devote their lives to provide the best care possible, going above and beyond to bring stability and comfort to the primates in their care. Staff dedicate hours each day to constructing enrichment, preparing special food based on individual needs, and making and administering medication throughout the day and occasionally after hours. 
On a day-to-day -day basis, we treat a wide variety of different health issues here. Um, we treat everything from snotty noses and cuts and scrapes to broken bones, um, hernia surgeries, infections, UTIs. There's just a wide variety from the minor stuff, just little bitty bumps and bruises to life-changing health issues, all of these things that can pop up. And a lot of them are the kind of diseases that they don't always show up just when you're looking at the animal. Um, if a monkey has kidney disease, you don't necessarily know that unless you're checking blood work and find that or monitoring their urine output or things like that, that caretakers are very in tune to and that we keep tabs on by bringing them in for examinations. But um, for a standard pet owner, that's not gonna be something that they're able to do on a regular basis. As the monkey gets older and starts to show behavioral issues as they reach sexual maturity and start to encounter health issues later on in life, um, and those animals end up getting brought to sanctuaries, the sanctuaries then have to spend the next 10, 20, even 30 years um, caring for that animal to make sure it has the best life possible, which means that we're the ones dealing with the expenses of those health issues that they develop later in life and dealing with the aftermath of having been a pet and getting that emotional stress that they've dealt with for years. Um, we're the ones that end up having to basically pick up the pieces for 20, 30 years. And it costs a lot. It takes a large emotional toll on all of us. It's a very labor intensive and yeah, it's, it's a lot. And of course, as a nonprofit, we're not in it for the money, but at the same time, knowing that we can make a difference in these animals' lives and give them the best possible life that they can have after what they've gone through is what keeps us coming back each day. It is difficult to see much reason to maintain inconsistent legislation as it currently stands. Permitting these interactions with primates directly puts the public in danger. Sanctuaries continue to burn through valuable resources to rescue unwanted privately owned primates that would be prevented from entering this trade in the future with effective federal legislation. We hope that lawmakers, wild animal facility owners and employees, exotic animal vendors and breeders, international trade experts, veterinarians, conservationists, and welfare specialists will unite in agreement that this trade must end and do all they can to ensure the successful passage of the long overdue Captive Primate Safety Act. Take action on the Captive Primate Safety Act by writing to your lawmakers and asking them to co-sponsor the Captive Primate Safety Act today by visiting this link on our website. Our report, Public Danger, Private Pain, The Case Against the U.S. Primate Pet Trade, published in 2021, examines the private ownership of primates in the United States from several perspectives with key expert contributions. To read this report, please visit this link on our website.